Hi, I'm Dr. Gwen, and my channel is all about creating content that empowers the neurodiverse community. In this episode, Dr. Etta Yanakone comes onto the show to share her unique, non-traditional, and dare I say, very cool way that she practices occupational therapy. Welcome to the show. I am so excited to welcome Dr. Etta Yanakone. Etta, how did I do? Perfect. Okay. Um, who is one of the most unique occupational therapists I know? Hi, Etta. Welcome to the show. Hi. I'm so happy. How to are be you? Here. Yay! I'm so happy you are here. Uh-huh. All right, Etta. I, in a way, I just want to like so hop right in, but. I think most of our audience knows in general what occupational therapists or OTs do, right? Maybe you can just give us a a quick sentence about that first, and then we'll like dive into your specialty. So I love this question because I feel like how an OT describes what OT is tells you a lot about how they approach (laughs) occupational therapy. So OT to me is... We're helping people do the things that they need to do, that they want to do, and that they're expected to do. That's like the big goal. But how we do that is a little bit special. So we're wanting people to increase their participation in meaningful occupations, right? But we use meaningful occupations to help people reach those goals. So we aren't just doing like exercises for strength or coordination or um attention we're using the paradigm of meaningful occupation to work on the skills that you need to then participate in the things that you need to do want to do or are expected to do um we use both like a rehabilitation framework and then also an adaptation framework to increase this um, meaningful participation. And what I mean by a rehabilitation framework is that we're looking for those foundational deficit areas um, to work on. So like ocular motor control or intrinsic hand strength or by manual hand use, like why is it that you can't participate in the um, meaningful occupation? And so we'll work on those foundational skills to build up access to the occupation, but we also use an adaptation framework. So we are, we specialize in either modifying the environment or modifying the activity for increased participation. And it's not like Mm -hmm. one of these is better or worse than the other. Um, but we often use them together so that we can get that maximal meaningful participation. So that's what OT is to me. (laughs) I love it. I, I mean, I think it's great. And I love that you said, you know, how an OT defines uh, OT is like really their framework. And I, you know, I mean, I've, I always learn something whenever I do these. And I love this for me, this layer of reha- rehabilitation and adaptation. I love that because it's like internal and external. You know, it's like I'm helping you with your your core kind of fundamental um, skills. And we're also seeing what we can kind of manage or manipulate or change in the environment in order for you to be able to access that environment in a more meaningful, comfortable way, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, I learned this the other day too, is like occupational, how you how someone occupies their time. And I was like, oh my God, I had, so what, where, where have I been? What? Anyway, so I just, I love it. And I think, I think in a previous life or maybe in my next life, I think I want to be an OT. I tend to really like, I love, I I just find myself talking to and jiving with OT so much. And I think it's because we share the neurological system, you know, and I think that's why um, I love it. Anyway. And a holistic approach, I think, is like another thing that really I know is important to you and is important to us. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, yeah. Yeah. And meaning, right. That like meaning drives everything. Um, what it means to the person drives 
it's just like the primary kind of driving force, I think, of intervention and support. And so I think that's another overlap. See, lots of overlaps, right? Yeah. Um, okay, Etta, you, your practice is so cool and so unique. So tell people what you do, what you get to do every day. <laughs> What you get to do, Etta, and how you practice OT. Yeah. I'm so lucky. So my practice um, is in a non-traditional clinic setting. So I work um, in a small ranch environment in Los Angeles where my clients and I participate in animal caretaking as part of every session. So we have chickens and rabbits and guinea pigs and horses. And uh, we use the occupation of taking care of them to work on both, like I was saying, different foundational deficit areas and then also um, as a meaningful occupation in and of itself. Yeah. I mean, this little ranch and, you know, I can say I have been on this ranch. The minute I put on those boots... And I walk out there, um, there is something super magical that happens. Um, it's almost like the world falls away. I don't know how else to describe it. Um, and there is a very Im immediate sense of just, I don't know, groundedness to, to the world. Um, and I, I think this is such a cool way, you know, I think uh, clients or anyone who loves animals and mm – -hmm you know, does better outdoors where it's not so frenetic and busy. Um, really, I've seen them really benefit from this setting. Um, yeah. So give us some example. Yeah, go ahead, Etta. Well, I was just going to say there's like two – two things that I wanted to point out about the environment. Yeah. One is it really takes the focus off the kid, right? We put all of the focus, or the adult, it really puts all yeah. of the focus on the animal. And I think that that is really different and really, really works for um, the clients that I see. Uh, and yeah. then the other really special thing about uh, the location is it's a, it's a community-based setting. So it's not a medical clinic. I'm hosted at the name of the ranch is the Children's Ranch, and it's this after amazing after school program um, where everybody is the community is coming together to take care of these animals. Um, and I think that the clients can feel that it's like a group effort. And like you were saying, uh, it really does feel like the outside world falls apart and the people who are at the ranch together are working together. And so I think those are two kind of very different um, components to the work that I do compared it to being in a sensory gym, like, which is also really cool and really yeah. specialized and amazing, but it's just like yeah. a really different feel. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then we're not saying anything that, you know, we're not saying like the ranch is the only place to do OT. We're, we're no. just saying it, well, this is such a cool, it's just, it's kind of that idea, you know, going back to meaning again, right? Mm -hmm. If this is an interest and the environment is a preference, let's just say, for someone's exactly. profile, right? Exactly. Then mm -hmm. there's so much that can be done from an OT perspective. I would even even go as far to say as a psychological perspective in regards to how I feel and my efficacy and what I'm doing. But you know, give us give us some examples, Etta, of how OT. And, you know, maybe interventions um, are being woven into this ranch setting. Absolutely. Okay. So one of my favorite activities, I'm always trying to come up with new activities, new ways. You know, there's certain chores that have to happen at the ranch. There's certain things that need to happen to take care of these animals. But where I get to put on my OT hat is like how I can modify these activities um, to work on different things. So for example, I have a client right now who's seven um, and we're working on his core strength. And so we, and he really likes the chickens. And so how I've modified feeding the chickens to work on core strength is we get a bucket of feed and we put it on the floor and then I give him a spoon and I have a paper towel, I mean, uh, wrapping paper tube, and I stick the wrapping paper tube into the uh, coop, 
and then he has to use the spoon to get one spoonful of feed up and into that tube and then it slides down the tube and the chickens get to eat it um and so we're working on he's super interested in feeding the chickens but also in like that sound of it sliding down the tube mm -hmm. um and we're working on that core strength as he's bending and lifting with control so that he doesn't <laughs> spill the feed which is just like um grain kind of mm -hmm. um and and uh so there's that intrinsic buy-in right to feed the animals and then yeah. there's also the foundational deficits that we're working on um being his core strength um and um sort of uh motor control as he moves slowly and purposely there's also you know a component of visual motor coordination and and utensil use and like all the all these different layers but the most foundational is that core core strength um and then yeah he actually, I was really proud of him he, two days ago, he actually scooped off the ground for the first time in prior sessions. I've had to put it up a little bit higher because it's just too hard to bend all the way down and then stand all the way up. So it's working. <laughs> He's like showing progress and, uh, and it's really fun. And yeah. yeah. Well, so. and, and, you know, you know, you're also working on attention and yes. intentionality and I, you yeah. know, we know, right? Like intention and attention, purposeful, that's really what leads to that, you know, neuroplasticity. That's really what leads to that kind of growth, right? Um, mm -hmm. Which is this kind of intentional movement. You know, when you talk about this, it makes me so happy because, you know, you're doing so many things at once, right? Um, utensils, um, core strength, motor coordination, sequencing, all of these great things, which is so different than like, a task box on a desk, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I, I feel like sometimes I get it. Like we want to work on, you know, fine motor, let's say dexterity and strength and control, but you know, moving pom-poms from one box to another, you wonder why we've got behaviors, you know, that, <laughs> that yeah. come out of it. It's just not yeah. very meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know? And yeah. So so, you know, you know, uh, OT's favorite tool, I feel like, is a paper clip, right? We love our paper clips because, <laughs> uh, um, not paper clip, sorry, clothes pin, clothes pin. Uh, <laughs> because we work on that pincer strength and then you can get the big ones and you can get the little ones and like whatever. Um, yeah. So how I use a clothes pin at the ranch is we make a foraging line for the rabbits. So we hang a string in their, uh, uh, their pen between the you know two walls and then we clip pieces of lettuce or pieces of herbs to it so that then they rabbits they prefer to eat they don't they prefer to eat when you feed them by hand versus eating off the ground at least the ones at the ranch do so then it's coming the food is hanging from above and so they're like either just reaching up or they're sitting up to eat and it's like the cutest thing ever and then you've also worked on that pincer strength that hand strength that coordination piece also while you're standing so you're working on your standing balance right your reach your functional reach like all this stuff so that we're often using similar tools but in such a different setting it really allows for more flexibility and more um, intrinsic motivation um and yeah that's another example of of an activity that we can yeah. do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's so lovely, you know, as you're talking about that. I mean, it's like so adorable. And and it's funny that you say clothespins because I'm like, I, I, you're right. I see clothespins a lot actually in OT work. It's, it, I, I get it. Like, I mean, like, I totally get it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I get it. I mean, I, I think like the takeaway from this is not that, you know, you have to, your kid has to go to a ranch or as an adult, you go, because you see adults too, right? At, a, at a, I mean, adults yeah. come to the ranch as well. I'm, I'm really only work with adults and young adults now. So, and they go to the ranch. This is yeah. how I know Etta yeah. uh, and know of Etta. Um, yeah. But, you know, it, it's like bringing meaning to the work. You know, when there, when meaning is lost in the work, then the work is, I think, what can oftentimes trigger dysregulation, which is the very opposite, I think, of what OT, OTs are trying to go for. Yeah, just to like build off that exactly, exactly what you're saying. 
the my practice at the ranch is perfect for people who love animals. If you have no interest in animals, it is the worst place you could come right. get OT, right? Like, right. so it's, right. it's beautiful and it's cute and it's adorable if we can build that human animal bond. If there's no interest in that, then like, and say you have an interest in um, uh, cars or something, right? Like uh -huh. then uh -huh. a, a more traditional setting might be better because you can incorporate toy cars and pictures of cars and car related activities in so many different ways than you could in my practice. It'd be really hard to incorporate a love of cars into <laughs> what I was seeing, uh, you know, in, into my sessions at the ranch. So yeah, I feel like, like you said, we aren't saying like, you know, traditional clinics are bad or anything like that. It's just this setting is, um, really intentional and meaningful for people who are interested in animals or and being yeah. outside. And being outside. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. You know, like you've, we, we have to, we have to make meaning, you know, for each client, you know, and you're right. You know, you don't like animals. Maybe you don't like to get dirty. Mm -hmm. Maybe you don't, right. That's going to, that's not a good place for you. Um, but this is the thing, and and I, you know, if you're an OT or you're a teacher, or you're a parent, or you know, you're someone that that um, is thinking about lesson planning and curriculum making, and you know, it you know, the first question for for us usually is um, why, like, why are we teaching the skill? How is this skill going to result in something um, qualitatively different for this person? Because if we're gonna ask them to work and do something difficult, it better be worth it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and they better see the reason why yes. to comply, right? Like, right. if you're asking someone to do something challenging, anyone, if you ask me to do something challenging, yeah. I'm going to want to know why. What am I getting from yeah. it? It doesn't have yeah. to be an immediate payoff, right? But I have to have the cognitive skill, um, the attention and in the moment to realize why it would benefit me to do something hard. And for some people yeah. that, you know, window is kind of short and for some people it's longer. Right. And you kind of have to know what the person's, um, you know, ability to understand that in the moment as you're designing the activity. Mm hmm. Yes, right? absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And that that has to be in mind, right? That's why, you know, in so many ways, people who do intervention, I think like creativity is really critical as a skill because okay. we're really trying, we're like, who's this person? What, what, what makes them drive? Like, like how, how, um, how do they like to be in the world? Okay, now how can I create an opening with their consent to work on something else? Yeah. Right? How do we do that? And I just love this. Like, and you had just mentioned like, you know, animal, human, bond. Mm -hmm. That is the valuable piece of mm -hmm. that. I'm, I want to be bonded. I, I care about this animal. And that's why I will work on that, those really, really tight, you know, clothes pins to put a piece of lettuce there. I will do that mm -hmm. because that's there. And so we can even talk about that from a relational standpoint with other humans, right? A lot of times we do things for other humans because we care about that human being, not because we necessarily want to do it for ourselves. But, um, and so all these pieces are like so critical, but I just love the meaning and the uniqueness and how different your setting, your your OT setting is. Because I, you know, who would ever think to have OT at a ranch? I know, right? Love it. love it. I love it. I love it. Um, Etta, when it comes to adults, because yeah. I work with um, a lot of adults, now mostly adults, mm -hmm. how do you see, do you see that it's similar, similar kinds of activities at the ranch? Um, do they change at all? Um, you know, I, I don't know if there's like a different application or a, a, not even different, but like just to like a, a pivot in any way when you're when you're working with adults versus kids. Yeah, there's a couple 
different things of, I mean, more than a couple, but like one of the first things that comes to mind is, um, the person's, uh, role in treatment planning and goal planning right Mm -hmm. there's like bigger discussion about like what are you wanting to do that you can't do or that you feel like you need more help with than you want help than you want basically so there's that piece of it and then the other thing that is different is um just uh despite it be, or it's a ranch setting, but we also have some um, common household appliances. We have a washer and a dryer and an oven and stove and sink. And so we can incorporate some more of those activities of daily living skills Mm -hmm. um, into our session so we can practice doing laundry, but we're doing, you know, the towels for the rabbits. Right. 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 Or we can practice, you know, we, we make, meal food for the animals all the time but we can incorporate a cooking piece into it for those adults um because of that's kind of like uh it's a little bit weird but right we have these like household appliances so um we can get pretty hands-on it doesn't have to be all abstracted so in uh when i was a student i felt i had a really hard time in like um one of my field work placements that was um, assisted or, um, an inpatient, um, rehab center. Cause we were working on like the, the clients could identify what they needed to do. And we would work on like, you know, the motor skills and the strength skills so that they could do it, but it was all abstracted, right? Because they weren't in their home, um, with the appliances and the tools that they'd be using in their home. And so I think that being able to actually practice, um, like, in a, a with the actual like physical things that you'll be needing to do in your home is really mm-hmm. valuable and so i really yeah. appreciate that. yeah there's like almost a direct relation to um you know what how you would do it on your own or in your own place you know and i just see those types of things like cooking and laundry um to be really important because from a self-concept and self-esteem standpoint, you know, like I -hmm. find that no matter where the verbal level is for my client and, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I think verbal language has really been misconstrued as like the only signal of intelligence. It's like, you know, just, you know, you and I have worked with many clients who have unreliable communication and, their verbal communication is not their primary form of communication. Right. And they are smarter than a, a I mean, sharp, sharp, yeah. sharp, yeah. Uh, witty and funny mm-hmm. and humorous. Yeah. And, yeah. and I just feel like, you know, no matter what um, level I see, when a person is able to take care of their bodies in the space they're in, I just see a greater sense of agency. Mm-hmm. And Absolutely. so... Yeah. And so the fact that you're able to work those things in, I love that you include your clients in the treatment planning. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think we do that enough. I don't think we get consent enough, you know. The best way to get buy-in, right? Like, I don't know, (laughs) like, you know, your parent oftentimes will tell me something, right? So that's a good starting point. But like, what's important to you, right? That's, that's the only way I feel like we're going to make real progress is to have, to be able to reference back to like, you know, remember in our first couple conversations when you said that you don't like that your mom has to help you do your laundry, right? That's why I'm having you do this activity, this animal caretaking activity in this harder way. Yeah. Yeah. Is, an, is an example of something like, you yeah. know, I, cause, uh, that's happened, right? Like uh, a kid is like, well, it'd be so, or an adult is like, oh, it'd be so much easier if I, so what I was having them do is <laughs> stand in one, one point while they and not move their feet while they're grooming the horse. So they really have to work on their functional reach um, and their balance. And they were pushing back and they're like, why? Like, it'd be so much easier if you just had me walk around and I groomed the horse and I could bring it back to, okay, remember, like we talked about, you wanted to be more independent with, 
I can't remember what it was, but they had like a functional <laughs> uh, kind of strength goal. And I was like, well, that's yeah. why I'm asking you to do this in this harder way. I want yeah. it to be fun. I could have you just like move a kettlebell around, but that would be kind of boring. So like, you know, let's use um, this environment and taking care of this animal to help both the horse and you. Yeah. Yeah, that's so cool. And, you know, it, we hear a lot about like equine therapy, you know, or hypotherapy where people are coming and they're right, they're getting on top of horses and riding. Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and this is very different. Oh, you, you guys, stop. right? This is not like go down to the children's ranch and hop on a horse. You know, oh. th this is, right? I mean, I know that. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, go ahead. We don't do any riding at the ranch. Right. I'm so glad mm -hmm. you brought that up the mm -hmm. ranch um and and that and that's coming from me who i live i moved out of state right I, right after i graduated i moved to new mexico so i could go work at a clinic where we got 90 percent of our clients on and we use that equine movement piece as part of our treatment and so when an ot a pt or a speech therapist is using is manipulating the equine movement as part of the treatment plan that's what we call hippotherapy uh -huh. And so I did that for three years and it was great and it was really cool. And it's a very awesome tool that can, I saw be life changing for, for yeah. clients, um, on all sorts of different levels, strength wise, coordination wise, level of arousal wise, sensory rise. Like it's, um, a very cool tool. And, you know, we can talk about that more at a different point, but what I was really missing in my work there was there is no need for a human animal bond when you're using equine movement in a ther in in um an ot session like it, there can be a human animal bond and i think it's um awesome and even better when there is but you don't actually need it to use the equine mm -hmm. movement for functional games you can have the kid on there playing with a toy and they will still be getting the same um, organized neuromotor inputs that they would be if they were talking about the horse and what it liked and what it didn't like or whatever. Um, mm. And so that's why I moved, part of why I moved back to California and started my own practice was because I, um, as, as useful and as cool as a tool as um, that equine movement, that hippotherapy is, um, I really missed the intrinsic motivation that the caretaking activities um, requires. Um, and it means that I serve a more select population like we've been talking about, but it's a population that I feel um, gets them, you know, gets the most out of, out of the setting that I'm in. And so yeah. what I call the work that I'm doing now is animal assisted occupational therapy because um, the animals, are, are a key part of the OT, but, um, Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've got a, I, I use a dog in, in my work cool. and, um, and he, he definitely assists me. Right. And oh. it's very, I mean, people will do more for him than they will for me yeah. in many yeah. ways. And I just use him like really creatively, um, mm -hmm. in sessions. And so, it's just funny because, and you're right, animals have, especially, uh, again, if the client's motivated yeah. by animals, <laughs> yeah. then it yeah. can be a really lovely, a lovely, a lovely tool and environment. Hey, Etta, mm -hmm. um, if someone were to hear about, you know, you and they want to find out more about you, what is the best way for them to get a hold of you? The best thing that... I, the thing I would recommend is um, Google searching interwoven occupational therapy because that's okay. a lot easier to spell than my name. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Oh my gosh. For those, for the audience, I had to, <laughs> oh my gosh, because Etta has this beautiful Italian last name and I was like, Etta, um, I'm going to need a little tutorial on how to say your, and she broke it down beautifully for me. I got it very quickly because of Etta's teaching but okay interwoven sorry go back interwoven therapy did you say interwoven occupational therapy okay and I'll, I'll put this in the show notes and the description for people cool yeah so that you know there's a phone number and an email right on there and it's it's just me so you'll get in touch with me if you reach out that way 
Yeah, it's so it's so lovely. And again, for those of you that are listening and, and you're in the LA area, um, it's just a really special, it's a very special application of OT that is just really magical in this very lovely setting. Um, uh, and again, like I'm saying that as a biased person who likes, you know, settings like that. So, um, but also, you know, maybe you're an OT and you want to learn more about this, you know, reach out to Etta and, you know, for any, for everyone else, it's like, maybe this is just a, a really quick reminder that, you know, um, whenever we are asking someone or presenting a demand to somebody, let's make it meaningful. Yeah. You know, let's consider interests and preferences and let's try to make it as meaningful as possible instead of just checking off boxes and completing file folder activities or something, you know, unless that's your jam. If it's your jam, then laminate, cut, and, you know, <laughs> Velcro it up. Anyway, <laughs> the, Ed, Ed, yeah. thank you so much for coming on and just – giving us just a breath of fresh air and just another kind of way that OT is being used in this in a really cool way. So thanks for coming on, Etta. Thank you so much for having me.